Okay, today we have Commissioner Bart Chilton of the CFTC, that is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, here to speak. Um, Commissioner Chilton has worked, well, he's a Purdue grad, okay, so uh, this is kind of a homecoming, I guess. He's been to football games here. Um, he has had several positions in Congress and in the Senate. He's a um, senior advisor to uh, Senator Daschle when he was the Democrats' uh, leader in the Senate. Uh, in 2007, he was nominated for a CFTC commissioner by then-President Bush and confirmed by the Senate. And in 2009, he was nominated again by President Obama and confirmed again uh, by the Senate. Uh, we're particularly to ha lucky to have him here at this time because, as I'm sure you're all aware, all the financial regulation in the U.S. is going, undergoing a massive overhaul. And the CFTC is going to be taking a lead in a lot of the new uh, things that are taking place, including the uh, uh, stricter regulation of derivatives. Um, so this is a, a very important time for the CFTC and for financial regulation in general. Uh, after the talk, uh, if you have questions, I would ask you to, uh, to please use the microphone there. It's, this is a big auditorium, and uh, help everybody else to hear if you could use that, uh, that microphone. Okay, Mr. Chilton. Hey, how kind. Is this working, guys? Sounds like it. Sounds like echo. Let's play heavy metal. Uh, thanks for being here. How many people, including the profs, are getting out of class right now? <laughs> All right, well, you, you may have thought, well, you know, this is going to be like some boring financial thing, but I get out of class. But I'm going to tell you, it's not that boring. Hopefully, I won't be bored, boring. But uh, as Paul was saying, and thank you, Paul, for the invitation, and thanks to all the, the folks at the business school for, for, for having, having me. And Clay Peterson here. Clay, you raise your hand, who worked with me in Washington. But uh, uh, this is the most momentous thing that's happened, the bill that was passed in July, uh, since really the 30s, when derivatives law was invented. Derivatives markets existed long before that, but really since the 30s, so it's a, a huge time. Let me give you just a quick flavor, if you left here with one thing, what you would remember. This bill will bring light to what are currently dark over-the-counter markets. Now, there's nothing wrong with over-the-counter markets, but over-the-counter markets are where we had credit default swaps. That's where AIG was involved in these bets upon bets upon bets that a bundled group of mortgages might fail. It was a very exotic sort of products. Uh, you know, more exotic than you would find in Las Vegas. And that sent AIG into a turmoil, and all of us, all U.S. taxpayers, ended up bailing out AIG. So these over-the-counter markets, these OTC markets, will be now regulated and overseen. Now, okay, fine. What's that mean? How, how big a deal is that? The regulated exchanges that our little agency oversees right now Overseas, and that's the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Board of Trade, the Intercontinental Exchange, uh, the New York Mercantile Exchange, there's some other ones, there's a Kansas City, there's one in Minneapolis. But all of that trading combined accounts for $5 trillion in annualized trading, $5 trillion. I know that there's people up here, particularly the profs, who know the answer, so I, I, I won't ask the question. Uh, the OTC market, the size, remember, $5 trillion. OTC market, $600 trillion. So when you think, well, is it a big deal? Yeah, it's a big damn deal. I don't know how the heck we're going to do it, but it's a big damn deal. Anyway, that's a little taste of what we're going to do. So I'm pleased to be here, particularly in South Bend, land of fighting Irish. I, I, I grew up in Porter County, and uh, my mom was actually born in South Bend. So I'm particularly pleased to, to be here. Now, even though I am a Boilermaker, and you guys handed us our hats early in the year, I'm always intrigued by uh, names that have sort of the moniker before them, fighting. So the Fighting Irish. And in Missouri, there's the Fighting Tigers. And Purdue just got killed 
uh, on Saturday by the fighting Illini. Now, this has nothing to do with futures, but I'll tell you a quick little story. When I was in college at Purdue, our pledge class does this thing where you've cleaned the house, you've cleaned the house, you've cleaned the fraternity house. Finally, you say enough is enough, and you trash the house, and you throw garbage on the floor, and you all go someplace. So where we went was Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. So I was a president of my pledge class, and I had to get all these 20 kids there. We put them all in a U-Haul in the back with the gate, with a keg of beer and a five-gallon bucket, and no light. And we drove the three hours to Champaign-Urbana. And when we got there, there was a fella that had a tuba, and he was struggling with it, and he had his uh, band uniform over his back, and he was sort of coming, and he comes up to the field house door, and it's locked. So he sort of looks around, and our U-Haul is off in the corner of the parking lot where guys were doing whatever they had to do after three hours. So he takes his uniform, and he hangs it on the doorknob. And he takes his tuba, and he walks around. Well, one of my guys, of course, goes up and grabs his band uniform. And the next day, at the Fighting Illini's homecoming, he walks out, marches out with the band. He's an appendage. The band's got a straight line. He's the last guy. And he goes out, and he goes out to the 50-yard line, and he runs around in a circle. And he goes like this, and he runs off the field. <laughs> it was quite a spectacle. Anyway, so the Fighting Illini. Anybody watch uh, Stephen Colbert, the Colbert Report? Any hands? Stephen does this thing called get to know a district. And he always calls them the fighting whatever. So he interviews a, a member of Congress, and he'll sit down and he'll say, Congressman or Congresswoman, tell us about the fighting second. Like they're a sports team, right? So he does that, no matter what it, what it is. So it's always interested me. The fighting boilermakers doesn't have the same ring to it. So you have a good moniker, moniker one that other people would like to have, including me. There is, however, a lot of fighting going on in the futures markets. How swift was that? Uh, <laughs> isn't that great? Hey, very good. There's Clay Peterson. Hey, Clay, thank you. There's fight. So, but there is, and people don't realize it. And if you talk to people in and out of the markets, they wouldn't know what the heck I'm talking about. So let me explain. These markets, and I know I'm probably going to do a disservice to your elementary derivatives class here, but these markets started like 150 years ago, pretty much in the ag markets. And the reason that they started was so that farmers and ranchers were able to even out their, their risk, and there were level prices for consumers and for farmers throughout the year. So in the spring, when you were planting, and there wasn't any corn or wheat or soybeans or, 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 or what, hogs or, or cattle or chickens, whatever it was, the price was sky high because there was no supply. But then in the fall, when you went, when they had harvest, there would be grain rotting on the streets. And the price would be nothing. And the farmers and ranchers would go, what have I done all year this for? I'm not getting any money. So the futures markets allowed that to be transferred over a period of time. So when the harvest came, you might have a guy, a speculator, might have somebody, maybe a baker, or somebody that's making cereal. Somebody that's going to use this underlying physical commodity, corn, wheat, whatever it is, uh, you know, hogs for bacon, whatever it is. So they'd say, uh, you know, I will pay you, Paul, in next February for your corn, and this is the price I'll get you. And the, the farmer said, well, okay, I'll hold on to the, the, the grain or the, the, or the hogs or whatever it is until then, and you reach your price. Now, ultimately, somebody's going to be a winner, somebody's going to be a, a, a loser in every, every time that happens in one of these trades. But it worked out, and it worked out for consumers because they weren't paying this really high price or this really low price. It was fairly consistent, and they could uh, do this with their family budget. So that's why these markets started, for commercial folks had an underlying interest in the physical commodity, and it would discover true price. Whatever the price of a pound of bacon is or a gallon of milk, that's the goal. So remember that, the two goals. Hedging risk, risk management for the commercial users, and uh, price discovery, which helps all consumers. So these markets operated really well. Finally, in the 30s, as I said earlier, uh, 
the, 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 the people that were regulating it back then were in the basement of USDA on 14th Street in Washington, and they got some tools, and it wasn't really until the 70s with the, uh, uh, the law that established this agency, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, if you can say it, um, in 70, it was written in 74, and, and the, the agency started in 75. Financial futures started uh, a, after that. But pretty much these things have operated very well for all these years. Now, when I say that, they operated pretty well until a few years ago in the unregulated futures world. Remember my stuff about the OTC and how AIG went under because of CDSs? So the unregulated stuff, the stuff that we are going to get to see, that's one area. That hadn't worked out so well at all. But the regulated exchanges have worked out very well. So generally what happened, why it changed, is because there was an asset class shift. What I mean by that is that people were investing in other things, whether or not it's banking or, or, or bonds or in the securities world. Uh, whether or not you're putting part of your 401k in IBM, folks started saying, you know what? What about corn? Or what about crude oil? Or what about gold or silver or platinum or palladium or copper? And so people started investing. Retail investors started investing through, through uh, uh, different money managers. And the explosion in this amount of money in the regulated exchange increased more than it ever has before. In a three-year period, it increased by $200 billion. $200 billion in three years. Now, that happened to be, and you have to draw your own conclusions because uh, I know there's economists here, but there's economists all over the map on this. And I've got mine in my hip pocket that support what I'm going to say. But there's people all over, in fairness. So you see this $200 billion that comes into these markets, gets dropped into the markets. At the same time, what's going on with prices of commodities? Like a skyrocket. You see crude oil goes up to 147.27, $147 a barrel, 147.27. Gasoline tops $4 a gallon. And people are having to choose between do I fill my vehicle up or do I fill the fridge up? I mean, it was a real deal. So whether or not this money that came in had an impact, you can argue it. But there's a particular group that I want to talk about that I think did have an impact, and studies at, at Princeton and Rice will say that that's true. These are what I call the massive passives. They're massive in, you know, you can figure that out, right? They're big, they're huge, they're gigantic, they're mammoth, real big. They're passive in that their trading strategy is different from what traditional speculators in these markets, the guys like Paul, who was, I said was going to you know, buy corn in February next year, he's making a gamble that that's probably going to be safe for me, maybe I'll make some money. Those are the traditional speculators. But these massive passives, so if, you're hedge, if a hedge fund or if an exchange-traded fund, which is trying to track the price of crude oil or whatever it may be, one of these investment vehicles, how you would get into them if you say, I want to, I think crude oil. You're, you're thinking about, what do I do? I got $10,000, I don't want to do. Uh, people talk about the futures market. I think crude oil is going to be worth more in three years than it is today. Sounds like a fair bet. So how do I invest in crude oil? You don't go individually and invest in crude oil. So you go to an exchange-traded fund. You go to a money manager, and they take a little commission, and they invest it for you. And what they tell you they're going to do is they're going to buy a futures contract for a duration, six months, whatever the duration is. And then when that comes to culmination, when it's the spot month, when that's about ready where either you got to get rid of the futures contract or you got to buy crude oil, and since I don't have a storage facility, I'm not going to buy crude oil, so i got to sell it. What they do is they roll those positions. So they sell the ones they have, for Paul and for me and for whoever else is invested in, in, in these things, and they buy long again. They continually go long because what they're trying to do is mimic the overall price of oil. Now, do they care if it goes up today or tomorrow or next week? Yeah, they'd like it to go up. But it doesn't matter to them that much. They're betting on three or five years. So they are massive in size. 
They are passive in their strategy, and all the traders know what's going on. All the traders know, and I'll tell you, there was one firm that had over 30% of the crude oil market in 2008, over 30% of the market. And everybody knows that 30% is going to get rolled. Well, all the traders are aware of this, and they're playing around it. And so it's distorting markets to some extent because it's sort of upsetting the apple cart for what's gone on all of these years. And it may be creating some sort of upward motion when they're in the market, and generally they're in the market and they're in it long. If they get out of the market, which they do at certain times, they did after the bubble burst in 2008, then the prices went down. Prices went down to 30, after it went up to 147.27 in June of 08, it went down to 36 something in December. They all got out. But by and large, they were long and staying in these markets. They're massive and passive, and I think to some extent, they may not have been driving prices. You know, these are, markets are all, you know, the, the, particularly the commodities of supply are, the prices are based upon supply and demand, just what you'd learn in Econ 101. But that doesn't mean when you have this massive influx, $200 billion, and you have this massive passive trading strategy, that it doesn't sort of push prices a little bit. So I think they contribute to that upward rise in that strategy. Now, who should care about that? Well, I care about it because I don't want to pay a heck of a lot for gasoline or oil or corn, or food, or bread, or beer, anything. So what do you do about that? Well, there's some things you can do. I've been calling for limits on the number of positions that you could have. So you couldn't have 30% of a market. Uh, there's a second group which is not passive in their strategy. And these are just large institutional investments, investment firms, and large banks. And they'll have 15, 20, 25 percent of a given market. Now, they're not passive, like I, I, I said. They'll get in it long. They'll get in the market short. For lack of a better phrase, they go both ways. Sometimes, many times during the same trading session. Sometimes at the same time with different traders. You know, what's going on? But they are so large that they also can have an impact. It's sort of like getting in a hot tub. So if, if I get in the hot tub, the water's going to rise just a little bit, right? Just, a, I mean, maybe a lot, because after I just ate. But it's going to go right just a little, little bit. And maybe that's OK. Now, if I jump in, it's going to make a big wave. But if I sort of get in over a longer period of time, just raise it a little bit, no problem. But the question is whether or not they are the footprint or what they're doing in that hot tub is making such a difference that it's creating an artificial price or whether or not it's just a normal up and down fluctuating in the market. So again, what do you do about that? If anything, position limits. How do you limit what they can, what they can hold? Now, if you set limits, as the, the law requires us to now. I've been calling this cent for this since 2008. There are five commissioners at the CFTC. I'm just one dude. And you need three to get anything done. So we had the authority before to institute position limits. But there were only two of us <laughs> that saw, thought it was a, maybe a good idea. Uh, now it's the law. Now we are required to do it for uh, essentially commodities of finite supply. We're required to implement them position limits by mid-January for energy contracts and for metals contracts, and then mid-April, which is 270 days after the passage of the bill, I don't know why they had different dates, for agriculture contracts. We haven't yet done anything on financial contracts. I'll talk about that just briefly in a minute here. So, the question is, how do you set, what's the right level? I mean, we take a poll. You know, uh, let's, let's take a poll. What the heck? OK. Everybody who thinks that you shouldn't have 70% of a market, any market, raise your hand. Keep your hands up. 51%. Shouldn't have 51%. 49%. OK, that's where it's a big cutoff. So, right. 
So would 10% be a legitimate level? I don't know, maybe 15, 20? I don't know what the right level is. We're doing a public comment period to figure it out now. But here's what I do know. If you make it too restrictive, if you make it too tight, you have to worry about what we call market migration. We're supposed to be a free enterprise society. We're supposed to let the good times roll and let the, 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 you know, the Darwin rule. And, and I don't have a problem with that in general, as long as there's some legitimate sideboards. So if you set the limits so tight, traders may say, oh, screw this. I'll go to London. They got, you know, they've got a Brent contract. Heck, they've got a, a West Texas intermediate contract that settles at the Henry Hub just like the New York Mercantile Exchange does. Why would they stay here? And these large traders, a lot of them, they're big banks anyway. They don't care. They have just as many people in London as they do in New York or Chicago. The argument used to be they would also go to the over-the-counter market. And so here we put limits to control the market on the regulated exchanges, and then the limits would be so tight that they'd go to this dark, evil area. Ooh, Halloween. But now that we're going to regulate the over-the-counter markets, that's no, no longer really a place. But there could be market migration to foreign boards of trade. So you can't go too low, and you can't go too high. I mean, if you say 49%, is that really doing what Congress asked us to do, was to not make sure that, this had an in, that these types of speculators had an inordinate impact on price? When I say the word speculator, it makes me want to say, without speculators, you don't have a damn market. So I'm not saying speculators are evil. Without them, no market, full stop. Forget it, all bets off. And speculators got to make money. And they're not just in it to be philanthropist. If they don't make money, they're gone. There is no market. So speculators aren't bad. Massive passives aren't bad. They just may be sort of unwitting bullies in these markets. And for the small or average person or company, you really have to fight. Here we go, fight. You have to fight to sort of get into these markets with these big, colossal, massive passives. You're fighting against these large guys. And the, the people that they were originally tended, intended to serve, remember? The commercial guy, the farmer, the rancher, all these guys, they may be precluded from actually contributing what they have to the markets. That was the purpose, remember? Hedging their legitimate business risk and price discovery. If they're not involved in the markets, it's just a gaming mark. So we need to protect that above all else. Now, I said, mentioned financial futures a minute ago. This is how rapidly this area of law and of markets is changing. The bill was passed and signed by President Obama in July. And at that time, they just said, we're going to uh, have position limits, mandate position limits for these commodities of finite supply that I talked about earlier. Well, the flash crash that occurred on May 6th, where the Dow dropped nearly 1,000 points, then it rebounded most of it. Stocks like Accenture went from $40.13 down to a penny. That, that took place because of a number of factors. The, market was, the markets were skittish. There was a high volatility that day. People were concerned about Greece and European debt. All of these things that, I mean, I guess could happen a lot of times, but they were happening that day, and then there was one trade, and it was a trade in a financial futures. So not the ones we're going to put the, 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 the position limits on. This was in the S&P, Standard & Poor's, E-mini futures contract on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And it was an algorithmic program, a, a robotic program, that sold 75,000 contracts in about a 20-minute period. It was a price-insensitive contract. It just sold. These guys showed up and said, today we're going to sell 75,000 contracts, which totaled about $4.1 billion, by the way. And they just sold. This boom, boom, boom. Every so often they just sold, they just sold, they just sold. What happened was the, the uh, E-mini futures price went down. And then other algorithmic traders, or high-frequency traders, robotic traders, I'm not sure what we should be calling them, they saw that it was low here, that that E-mini futures went down, and that they could arbitrage it with actually Standard & Poor's related products in the securities world. So they started like nanoseconds, you know, picking up little micro dollars by the thousands, trying to arbitrage between the lower S&P futures, mini futures, and these other related products in the securities world. 
And it worked for a few minutes, and then all these markets started tumbling. And then everybody pulled out. Oh, crap. There's something going on. All the, uh, ooga, ooga. Everybody's algorithmic programs shut down. Really freaked everybody out. So that's what happened. But again, we're not supposed to put limits on financial futures. At least we're not required to put them. We still have the authority. That authority that I talked about we had in 2008 that people didn't want to do, we still have the authority to do, to put limits. And I think we should. I don't know what the limits are. Some of us were talking at lunch about it, looking for ideas. I don't know how you set the limits exactly. I'm not even sure about the actual working dynamics of the, the financial markets, which are by far and large the largest of the markets in the futures world. The number one, the highest volume in futures world are euro dollars. And so these financials are a big deal. Uh, the exchanges, all of them, they make money on volume. They don't want anything limited. Now they want efficient, effective markets, of course. So if, if, if limiting them that, that meant to them that their markets were gonna be safer, they might do it. But by and large, they've got a motive, profit. And as a government employee, my motive doesn't involve profit at all. So it seems to me some sort of limit on financial futures product is needed. I'm hopeful that when we do it for do position limits for the other commodities of finite supply, either in January or in April, that we'll also do them for financial futures products. We're, we're going to, at the end of November, have a comment period, and I hope people will comment uh, and tell us if that's a good idea or a bad idea. The second area is these robotics, these, these high-frequency algorithmic programs that are really so fast and doing things that you know, people really can't contemplate that they can have sort of, uh, I guess it's a vogue to be rogue around election time here, but they can have, uh, they can be renegade. They can sort of run off and we've had, in addition to the flash crash, we had a mini flash crash earlier this year with one algo gone wild uh, program that the company lost a million dollars and guess how long it took? One second. Okay, well, maybe they deserve it. They had a crappy program, something went wrong, they lost a million dollars. But thank gosh it wasn't somebody's 401k. And it, shouldn't there be, have some sort of responsibility for these algos run wild, these renegade computer programs? We have a new authority in the bill called Disruptive Trading Practice Authority. And I'm hopeful that when we sort of put meat on the bones on what those practices are that are disruptive, that we include sort of runaway algos in that list and that they can be, uh, folks can be punished for letting them do that. They can really royal markets. The last area I want to talk about. So we also need limits somehow on high frequency trading, but I don't know again how to set that. I don't know what it is. I'm looking for ideas. Uh, after this you could tell me, but it seems to me that as regulators all too often people in government are just sort of, you know, where's my desk, uh, when's my break, and how do I go along? That we should be more like sort of the police department and trying to be detectives and think about what might happen, how things might occur, what could go wrong, rather than coming in after a flash crash-like event, like the fire department and charring down the, 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 the sort of remains. So we need to be thinking about these things, even if they're not popular, even if they sort of violate somebody's sense of what's good and bad. It's just discussion. It's open democratic society. Try to figure it out. Try to get the best minds to do it. So the last area, originally when I was talking about, when I was thinking about talking here, uh, I was thinking about using the sort of a four horsemen analogy, you know, the players back from the 20s. And, and, uh, but, you know, it's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I'm like, well, do I really want to equate these markets with the apocalypse. Uh, I mean, position limits are needed, but you know, are they death and war and <laughs> corruption and all these things? Uh, figured an important job, but not that important. So, uh, but I was trying to think of four things, and I wasn't going to mention this until we were uh, talking at lunch about international stuff. So the, the four things would have been, if I had used my four horsemen analogy, was one bringing these OTC regulated markets uh, 
bringing them, on, bringing them under our purview. Two would be position limits. Three position limits on the massive passives and other large traders. Uh, three would be doing something with uh, Vogue Rogues uh, and the, the algo trading that's, that's gone wild in certain circumstances. And the fourth would be, my fourth horseman, would be uh, harmonization of rules and regulations. Because what happened in the flash crash was that, that arbitrage that I told you about between the S&P, mini futures, these other things, those were in the securities world. Well, the securities world didn't have some of the stopgap measures that we have in the futures world. We have something called stop logic. So when prices drop by a certain percentage in a certain time period, there's a pause for several seconds, six seconds. It allows liquidity to rebuild into the market. People may not even know that it's occurring. And so it sort of slows things down. It's sort of like a little bit of a governor on a car. And so I'm trying to think if I wanted to talk about another thing on the cars when I said, said that. No. So we've got high frequency traders. We've got the harmonization between the, the two. But if the flash crash had occurred at 9.30 in the morning when the European markets were open, we would have had a global meltdown. I mean, it would have been a global sort of rock your financial world. Luckily, they weren't open. But I mean, is that what we want to rely on in the future? Hey, that was pretty good luck, wasn't it? I mean, shouldn't you guys be requiring me to be looking at these things and say, well, hell, <laughs> what could have gone wrong? And what do you do about it? So it's not just the harmonization between the securities and the futures world and putting in places things like these stop logics that I talked about. They call them circuit breakers in the securities world. And it's the same sort of deal. If it goes down by a certain percentage, they pause or stop trading. Those need to be, I think, this is for my brethren, at the, my brethren regulators at the SEC, but it seems to me those probably need to be tightened more so that these are really harmonized between the securities world and the futures world. And likewise, to the extent that we can have harmonization globally, we can't go over to you know, the UK or the EU and tell them we'll put these rules in place. But talking with them, as we're doing, makes a lot of sense. Trying to figure out how we can harmonize this stuff globally. These are interrelated markets that operate pretty much 24-7, except for maybe 13 hours a week. So they're a big deal. Anyway, that's pretty much all I had to say. I, I was at the, uh, uh, I've been watching football games, and I watched yours yesterday, unfortunately, part of it. There's one point, there's been a lot of great conclusions, um, and very exciting. And uh, so I don't have a great conclusion other than we're going to hire 500 people. Anybody need a job? <laughs> we're going to hire like 500 people in the next couple of years. And we really are looking for folks, and we're looking for interns. We're looking for people who have an interest in financial markets. This is a really exciting time. It's, a, it's, it's momentous like all get out. And to the extent that you all are interested, feel free to let me know. Shoot us. Go to cftc.gov. You can get my email there. In general, if we go back to the original purpose of these markets, like I said, a legitimate price risk management and ensuring a, a fair price. Well, it's, not, it's, a, it's a fair price because it's a price that is discovered in a fair process for consumers. Uh, if we do that, we'll have more efficient, effective markets. They'll be devoid of fraud, abuse, and manipulation. And it'll make us all better as a better country. It'll, it'll help fuel the economic engine of our democracy. I think we'll all be better off. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Paul, should I just stand up? How would you like to do it? If you did have it, it would be it would be fairly minor. It wouldn't it wouldn't have roiled markets like it did. So then position limits aren't necessarily something we need as an answer. Well, we need them one because they happen to be the law, so I gotta do it. But um, 
Well, no, I'm sorry. They don't have to be the law for the, they, we have the possibility. I'm sorry. We, they're the law for the commodities of physical supply. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, it's just a question. I think, to me, it seems that if you did all of that, maybe you'd be okay. If you did it in the other markets all across the world, world maybe you'd be okay. But we're leaders in these markets. I mean, we've got the most ef efficient, effective markets in the world. And to me, we should go out and show how we can do something uh, and, you know, damn the torpedoes to some extent. Let's, let's put something in place that can work. Now, if you could blink and you could put those places in, in you know, 85 countries today, it might work. But here's what I know. We've got the largest futures markets in the world. And if there's going to be a problem, it's going to be in ours. So I think we've got some responsibility to be leaders, not just to wait around. Again, I don't want to have a, another mess on my hands. If the answer is that these aren't a good idea, I want to hear it from everybody. But Absent anything else, somebody's got to give me a good alternative. That's not a bad one, but again, you've got to do it right away in all these major, you wouldn't have to do it in all 85 right away, but you'd have to do it in Europe right away. You'd have to do it in Singapore and, and Hong Kong. I think if you did, actually, if you did Europe, you'd probably be pretty well on your way. Then if you did Hong Kong, you'd probably be, you could probably, if you did those three, everybody else would follow. You want to follow up or are you okay? Okay. I have a question about the, the products that trade OTC right now that aren't regulated. Yeah. Now, when you speak of regulation, do you want them on a central clearinghouse or do you want them to trade on an exchange? Because the two are actually pretty yeah. different. Do you want to, okay, so the law, I think, encourages, this is my reading of the law, I think it encourages things to be put on exchange. I think the law and, and members of Congress sort of want it to all be regulated in a consistent fashion. But you've got idiosyncratic contracts out there that, uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way, uh, I may want to do s something different than just a regular contract that's traded on an exchange. Those bilateral types of contracts are always going to exist. They should exist. Government shouldn't stop it. The question is, are they ever large enough that they can pose some sort of risk to that company? Because then we're the ones that ultimately can get in trouble there with having to bail somebody out. So uh, there's a variety of things that are in the bill with regard to uh, setting up clearing entities and ensuring that uh, there's actually stop gaps and there's adequate margin that will help. But ultimately, I think Congress wanted as many of these things as possible to be put on exchange. And the others that can't, the others that are idiosyncratic, they're going to have to trade separately, but they are going to have to be cleared. There's an exception to that, by the way. When I remember I was talking about the commercials. If you're an end user, so if you're ADM and it's uh, an ag commodity, you're exempt from having to, having to post margin to clear. You still have to clear, rather. I messed that up a little bit. You still do have to clear. You're not exempt from clearing. You're exempt from an increased margin under this end user exemption. So if you're an airline and you're hedging your risk on jet fuel, you don't have to pay an increased margin for that in clearing. You look like I didn't answer your question. You want to follow up? I just have a follow up question. With when you're putting, so I understand that the government wants to put the majority of things on exchanges, but some of the products that trade OTC right now, um, my understanding of just with equities, let's let's say you know you have a buyer and a seller, but a lot of the type of like uh, credit default swaps that you had referenced to before, there's not just one buyer and seller. There's, I mean, maybe I want to go short, but mm -hmm. that trade is also pieced off with Goldman and Morgan right. and like three other counterparties. Yeah. So my question, I guess, is like that doesn't seem possible to put that on, or, or if that was put on an exchange, it would seem to have to be a two-way street. Yeah, well, you'll also have these things called, this is new in the law, called swaps execution facilities, okay. CEFs, they call them. And those would be uh, things that, that, that aren't a traditional contract traded on an exchange. We haven't written the rules to say exactly how they would operate and how they would be comprised of what sort of things they'd be allowed to do. But that sort of thing, which is different, you're right, than what would happen on a normal exchange, that's probably a place where we would 
you could see that. Otherwise, you would just have, it wouldn't be bilateral, it could still be a multilateral. But again, unless they're end users, it's going to be, have to be cleared. But I think the, the prominent, predominant place that would probably end up, and I can't prejudge what we're going to do, but would be at one of these swaps execution facilities. That seems like a better, I just, I mean, just to share my experience, I come from a trading background and with a lot of those products, and that immediately when I think about being put on an exchange or regulated would be a problem yep. initially because we have various counterparties and a lot of the, especially credit default swaps, they don't just trade once, they trade, they- Yeah, they trade you know, multiple they trade times. Multiple it's part of the time. problem with them. Right, right. and they, they, they just, over, Again so. and again and again, bets upon bets right, like, upon so bets. Maybe if you did like a $20 million trade with one counterparty, yes, but you know, you're facing these two firms on the other side of it. So I can understand like with the new swaps, can, wait, say that again so that I look it up. Swaps execution facilities. Swaps execution Seth. facilities, yeah. Because I know yeah. some of those trades now will just go through like, is it D, DTC or D? DTCC, yeah. DTCC, and yeah. that's, um, I think there's a problem with that, and you, I'm sure you have much more knowledge than I do about this, because the delay, just the, I think you get about three days to go to state, you know, where the margin is or where the collateral is mm -hmm. or who the counterparties are, and not, and having that much time, that's a lot of risk to be open, going mm -hmm. home at night. Right. Um, so I will look that up, because that seems like a better, uh, a potentially better option for, because I just, because I, will say I, bet, I don't need to talk so much, but I've definitely had circumstances where I've gone home with a, like a type of OTC trade um, that I was open, you know, quite a lot, and I had three days to, you know, say to the, uh, the other counterparty where, how is that trade being allocated? And right. it's very, personally, it was very personally upsetting, right. but I couldn't get the counterparty to answer to me because I couldn't make, there wasn't a law, I couldn't make them say, this is yeah. the way the trade's well, allocated. Well, that's, that's really, I mean, I gave you sort of the big thing that would happen, bringing this $600 trillion onto exchange. You know, if there's one thing, remember that was gonna happen. But if I, had, if I gave you one thought about what the bill is going to do, uh, not a specific policy goal, it's transparency. It's how do we bring these things into light? Because even when there's going to be bilateral trades or these idiosyncratic trades, they will still be reported to us. At the very least, they will be reported to government. So we'll see it. Now, what the heck we do with it? I mean, millions and millions of trades, you know, in Clay's office. I mean, but at least we could go get them if we needed to. No, that, well, you're going to need to be bigger office. Like the ideal, to, to be honest, like, because there's a certain counterparty out there. I remember at the end of the day, I could, I would get the trade done in the morning all day. I, I'd be calling and be like, I need the, you know, the margin or the collateral or who's right. it going to? And, if there was another counterparty that could spend their time, that that was their function right. of what they did, that would be a lot more helpful than the trading desk right. perhaps doing it. And I think would also command an amount of, uh, also with being a third party, that like we have to do this because it's the law. Got it. So I think that that's a good way to go. Sorry. Okay. No, thank you. Feel free to email me. Sir. Hi. I believe you've made some public comments recently about the silver market. And I wondered if you could explain a little bit about why you may believe it may be uh, being manipulated. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on it, unfortunately. I just, uh, uh, I went out last week and, and talked about silver markets a little bit, and uh, I did so sort of ahead of my colleagues. And uh, if you're interested in what I said, you can either look at cftc.gov or go to Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times. But uh, we're in the middle of an investigation now, and I'm going to uh, sort of let the commission decide what they're going to do. Um, I probably said enough when I said it last week, so I'll leave it at there. There and there, okay. Um, last week I heard about a potential merger between the uh, Singapore market and the uh, Australian market. Um, what do you think this would have an effect on, like, the law that you guys are putting into place? What about the Singapore market and the Australian market? I didn't there's, catch it. There's talks of them merging together. Merging, the yeah. And being, like, the second largest within the Pacific region and fifth largest in the world. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't, I haven't heard that. Um, well, the, the Australians have a really good, solid regulatory regime. And so do, the, so do they do in Singapore also, actually. Uh, uh, I was in Singapore last year. And... Uh, uh, you know, they do, uh, uh, they do securities and, and futures at the same regulatory agency. Um, so th the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, how they harmonize their, their rules and regulations, just like we were talking about uh, globally. Uh, because, you know, as much as I'm talking about all these things that we want to do and we're going to do and are required to be, to be done, I get it that these are added costs on businesses. 
And I get it that if we're not careful, we could lose markets. And, and, and I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, but I want to protect, cons protect consumers above all. So you went real, real quick here, and then we'll do there. How are we going to what with regard to regulation? Coordinate the international regulation. Well, there's a group called IOSCO, International Swaps and Securities Exchange, blah, 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 blah. No, but, they, but we work with them all the time. They're, they're sort of a quasi-government agency. And we meet with our international regulators all the time. Uh, the CFTC actually, sort of when I was talking about us being leaders and everything, we hold an international conference every year. Our staff does in Chicago. And we get, you know, 80 people from around the world, other regulators. I mean, Japan, we bring in interpreters, and we tell them about what we're doing and how we're, how we're doing things. That doesn't mean it's always right, and you always have to judge sort of, you know, what you say in talks like this versus, you know, they, do, they are different countries. They do have their own sovereign rights. They probably don't want, you know, the Yankees telling them exactly how to do everything. That doesn't mean that we don't have good ideas. It doesn't mean that we can't get other good ideas from them. So I think it's just working with them all the time. I'm actually surprised at the amount of coordination and the general thrust in which we seem to be going with the EU. If you'd asked me a year ago, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought we had a chance of being close. And I would be more and more concerned about this regulatory arbitrage. Uh, but uh, we're working real closely with them and talk to them all the time. And we've got an international affairs division, uh, you know, eight or ten people. They do nothing but work with people. And they're also joint efforts that people don't see. Um, so it's not just going to international meetings and, you know, going to Wiesbaden or whatever and talking in a conference room and having, you know, foie gras or something. It's, uh, uh, we have an ongoing enforcement efforts that we do. So a lot of these cases that we do actually involve, I mean, these banks are multinational banks. These are people that are all across the globe. So we have to work with them with international regulators on a daily basis, and we do. So we've got a pretty good relationship, and I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, in purely economic terms, any restriction that you bring on the markets will introduce some kind of ineff inefficiency. So uh, is there a way to quantify when, when you set those position limits to find out what is the inefficiency? And uh, considering that any effect could be global, Yes. Uh, how much inefficiency in whatever form uh, are you willing to take? Uh, well, I want the most efficient, effective markets. Um, here's what I know. When I was out there calling for position limits in 2008, there was no discussion about what the right level was. It was just like, you're a nut, screw it. Gas is high because gas is high. And doesn't have anything to do with these massive passes, doesn't have anything to do with large people. Just, we don't like it. And... It wasn't until the law was changed that people entered into the discussion about what is the right level. Their view was just it was horrible. I really did ask this guy, when I, guys ask you, when I ask you guys a question about 70%, I ask a guy, John Hyland with US Oil, an exchange traded fund, is 70% of a market too much? And he said no. That's the attitude. So what are, what's, how much am I willing to, to you know, I don't know the right level. I'm just a guy. I worked on Capitol Hill for 25 years. I'm a policy guy trying to figure out. My mantra is always, how do you get to yes? Not, there's plenty of people in Washington. It's an old saying. If you're not part of the solution, there's plenty of money to be made be a part of the problem. <laughs> but when you're actually in the position, when you're working for these guys that are supposed to get laws passed and stuff, that's not really, it's not supposed to be an option. You could comment on current circumstances, but you're supposed to try to move the country forward and do things. And so that's what I'm trying to do on position limits. And it's the reason that I raise financial. I think it's probably the right thing, but it may not be. I don't know. I want to talk with smart people, which is why I'm so glad to be, be here. And so glad I'm going to be in Chicago with these hundreds of people today and tomorrow and Thursday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, talking about this stuff. So I'm not, I don't want to suffer inefficiencies. I think our system can handle changing business models, however. We've had a lot of people that have come in that just want to get out of the rule. They didn't get that there's been a law changed. These are the same people who are lobbying Capitol Hill 
against this, the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Now they are you know, are lined up at our door, and it's amazing to me how many of them don't get it. They'll say, we don't think Congress meant this. Well, I think it does. Or we think that we should be exempt from this. Matter of fact, we think we should be exempt, and everybody after us, that's where you draw the line. But we're exempt. I had, some of you appreciate this, this end user exemption. I was sort of messing it up earlier. I got it right, but I was sort of messing it up. The end user exemption, which is you have to clear. Everybody has to clear. But if there's, if it's, if there's an increased margin requirement for that clearing, if you're a commercial end user, you don't have to pay that. Because you don't want to take the capital from Southwest Airlines or ADM that they could be using to whatever, build a fuel efficient jetliner or build a new ethanol plant or whatever it is. You don't want to take that capital and just tie it up in margin when they've actually got physical attributes that they could sell if they ever, if they ever went under. I had a hedge fund come in and say, we are, the hedge fund, a natural counterparty to these end users. Therefore, we should get the end user exemption. Well, they're money managers. And they're not, they don't have anything to do with corn or wheat or, or, or anything. They're money managers. That's how sort of far it's gone out. And I, last thing on the lobbying of us, I had one law firm, same guy, in two weeks that came in with three separate clients. Two of them were seeking an exemption, and one of them said, we want, you to propose, we want you to postpone the law for six months. Sorry, Charlie, they just don't get it that the law has been changed. They are gonna have to change some of their business models. Maybe their compliance officers are gonna have to do things a little bit differently. But guess what? It hadn't worked out so hot in the last decade. I mean, we had an economy that went on a highway to hell because of how the deregulatory approach since 1999 took us on this flight path. It wasn't so good. So we're trying to do the things, hopefully we don't go overboard. That doesn't mean that we won't at some times, that we'll have to scale back. What I've suggested, by the way, on position limits, just thinking about that made me want to say this, that, that we do err a little bit on the high side. We'll get back to your efficiency question. That we can further calibrate. So I don't think 49%, but maybe you say, I don't know what percent, I want to throw out a number, but maybe you err on the high side. You say, I don't want people to move away right now. And then as you get a better sense, and as all this information on the OTC world comes into Clay's office, when all of this information about the, uh, the $600 trillion that's out there comes in and we, change, we have a different view of the market, that whatever that is, and I think it probably makes sense to be a percentage as opposed to a hard and fast number, because the market size is going to be changing all around. That you err on the high side at first, that we do no harm, and then you further calibrate. My guess is that probably means ratcheting down a little bit, but not necessarily. But you further calibrate every year or so. Anyway, uh, two more and then we'll call it quits. Can you tell us how comment letters affect what you do? Yeah. The, uh, well, you know what? It's a great question. Uh, I'm so glad you raised it, actually. Because a lot of times it doesn't matter squat. It depends on who you are and where you are. Uh, when I worked at the agriculture department, we had 300,000 comments. It was on USDA's regulation of organics. You know, the label, you say USDA or organic. There's all sorts of different levels of it and everything. And it was the first time that people started using the internet to comment. So a lot of them were sort of the same thing. Um, so, you know, how many times can you read the same postcard or the same email or everything? Um, but it really depends on the people in government who are looking at it. I requested, and my colleagues agreed, to put out a request for comments on all of these rules even before we proposed them. So you can comment today at CFTC Gov on any of these things. You can say I'm all wet on the stuff I talked about. There's 30 different issue areas that we have, 30 different buckets. There'll probably be dozens more than 30 uh, rules, but there's 30 different areas, and we are looking at all of them. As a matter of fact, what I've done, we've had, I think, I don't know, a handful of rules. Six or seven of the rules so far have been proposed by the agency, and I'm making a point 
of asking the staff when they sort of are testifying to us and telling us what it does for the public and we can ask questions. I'm asking the staff, how many people commented? What did they say? How did you address it? And if you didn't address it, why didn't you address it? What's your best judgment? And uh, at, during that process, uh, we add or subtract things. Uh, we ask a question on this. I mentioned when I was talking about holding uh, algos accountable, you know, you let this runaway thing go wild and should anything be done. We are on that, that's called disruptive trading practice. And we didn't put out a proposal. What we did was we asked a bunch of questions. And so I said, let's ask one more question. Should these people be held accountable? And if so, how? Um, so that's in there. So you can go on and say, yes, they should or they shouldn't or whatever. So it's very important. And, and, and uh, put it this way, if the bureaucrats, and they're really great people at the CFTC. I've been very impressed. They're very smart folks that work extremely hard. But if some individual who's writing one of our proposed rules to present to the commission doesn't read one of these comments, I'm going to ask, about it, ask them about it in a public meeting. Now I think they're all onto that sort of thing. So they come with, one I did two times ago, I asked a question and you have to be careful, but uh, the, the person didn't know the answer, wasn't familiar with the letter. I had the letter with me. It went on to another commissioner. I went around and I handed it to her. So I think that people are sort of paying attention to the comments. One more. Flash crash gauge? Yeah, I don't know about that. Hmm. No, but I look forward to it. I've got five papers in the car that I didn't crack any of them. Uh, but no, well, I mean, they're getting smarter and smarter how they can do these things. I don't. Did you have one? We'll do this last one. Did you have a question? Yeah, I do. I think we need limits, but it's, like, it's sort of like the financials, too. I'm not really sure how to set them. Um, I mean, uh, the reason, one of the reasons I mentioned my hot tub analogy was I didn't get back to the, the second thing earlier. So my analogy was you're a big trader like Bart, and you get in the hot tub, and the water goes up a little bit. If I jump in, I throw all my trades in at one point, it ruffles the water. Well, your question really is if you're an algorithmic trader, say, you're, say we say you can have 10% of a market. Okay, fine, you got 10% of the market. You get into the hot tub. You get out. You get it, you get out. Could you trade 10% of the market 10 times in 110 seconds? That hot tub's gonna be pretty volatile, and so would the markets. So, I mean, should there be some sort of duration on when you could trade that a certain percentage of the market? Or should there be, uh, a requirement that says that you can't change your net positions in one trading session. Say you didn't put limits on financials. Uh, could you say you can't, you can't change your net position on e-mini futures or on T-bills or on euro dollars by more than this percent in a given trading period? So obviously, I don't know exactly what the answer is, but it seems to me that there is something that should be done. Do you have a thought on it yourself? Anybody have a thought on that, on the algos, whether or not there's something we should do? And if so, some great idea that I can go back to Washington and say, and this kid at Notre Dame said this thing, and I think we should do it by damn it. Come on, you'll be famous, make you famous. Okay, well, thank you very much. Appreciate you guys, your attention. Take care.